Hello students, in this video, I am going to talk about capacitors. Capacitors form a very important part of the IITG mains and advanced syllabus and hence this video. First, what is a capacitor? A capacitor is nothing but a combination of two conductors that are charged with equal and opposite charges that is if one of the conductors has a charge plus q the other one should be charged with a charge of minus q right so this is the conductor let's call this conductor a and there is another conductor of arbitrary shape that's called as B. If this conductor is given a charge plus Q and uh, this conductor is given a charge minus Q, they are equal and opposite charges, then this conductor is said to be at a potential V plus and the other conductor is said to be at a potential V minus and they are separated by a small distance. Such a combination is called a capacitor. The capacitor symbol, these are the symbols for the capacitor and uh, one of the plates is positively charged and the other plate is generally negatively charged. Right. Now the total charge on the capacitor by which we mean the net charge is zero. That is, there is a plus Q plate and there is a minus Q plate. These are the two plates of any capacitor and therefore the total charge becomes zero which is the net charge on the capacitor. Right. Now, the capacitance has to be defined in terms of the charge that is injected onto the plates. Now, how can we charge the capacitor? The capacitor has to be charged by connecting a source of EMF, that is a battery to the capacitor. Let's say we are connecting a battery of potential difference V. This is the positive terminal of the battery and this is the negative terminal of the battery. The positive terminal of the battery is connected to one of the plates and therefore this plate would be charged with a positive charge plus Q. The negative terminal of the battery is connected to the other plate and therefore a charge of minus Q would be injected onto this plate. Now these two charges are equal and opposite and that forms a capacitor. Now the charge on the capacitor therefore is proportional to the potential difference or source of potential difference. So Q is proportional to V and this constant of proportionality happens to be C which is the capacitance. So capacitance C is equal to Q over V. This is the one of the first relationships that we have to learn in capacitance. Right. Now, the unit for capacitance is unit for charge over unit for potential. That is Coulomb per volt. One Coulomb per volt is called farad that is the unit for capacitance in practical systems a farad is a very large unit for capacitance and therefore a more practical unit is microfarad one microfarad is as we know 10 to the power of minus 6 farad this is a more common and 
practical unit for capacitance of many capacitors in circuits. This relationship connecting the capacitance with the charge and voltage indicates there is a dependence of the capacitance on the charge and the voltage but that is not the case. The capacitance of any capacitor depends only on the geometry that is the size, the shape and the distance between the plates. of the capacitor. These are the parameters that affect the capacitance value of any capacitor. Additionally, the region between or the gap between the two plates can be either air or vacuum, of course, or any other medium. The electric medium can be filled in between the plates of a capacitor and therefore the value of the capacitance will also get affected depending upon the medium that is filled between the plates of the capacitor. The next topic is calculation of capacitance. Here I am going to discuss a general procedure for calculation of capacitance of any given capacitor of arbitrarily any shape. The general procedure for calculation of capacitance is First, one has to establish the electric field in the region between the plates. And then, one has to calculate the potential from it, the potential difference rather, between the plates. potential difference between the plates of the capacitor and then from the potential difference one can calculate the capacitance using the known expression C is equal to Q over V. So this is the general procedure to establish capacitance of any given capacitor. Predominantly one has to study these three capacitors for the competitive exams. Those three common types, most common types of capacitors are parallel plate capacitor, spherical capacitor, and cylindrical capacitor. Now we will proceed to discuss each of these capacitors in some more detail. First we will discuss the parallel plate capacitor. This is a simple construction of a parallel plate capacitor. It contains two plates of area A each and the two plates are charged with the help of a battery. The top plate is charged with the charge of plus Q while the bottom plate is charged with the charge minus Q by connecting it to the positive and negative terminals of the battery respectively. And there is a small gap between the plates and the gap is small d. Now the charge density which is a surface charge density because these two plates in a parallel plate capacitor are thin metal sheets. So thin metal sheets whose area is generally much larger than the gap between the plates. Such metal sheets can form a parallel plate capacitor. For such metal sheets, one can define what is called the surface charge density sigma, which is the charge, total charge over the total area. This is the surface charge density for each of these two thin metal sheets. Now, the procedure for calculating the capacitance of such a parallel plate capacitor is, as I mentioned before, first calculate the electric field between the plates, then calculate the electric potential and then get the capacitance using the simple relationship. First let us begin to calculate the electric field 
between the two plates. Now the simplest ways to calculate electric field between the two plates is by using Gauss law. So we know from Gauss law that the surface integral of E dot ds where ds is a small area is equal to the charge enclosed the charge enclosed q enclosed i call it over epsilon naught in this particular case we have to construct for the two plates thin plates a gaussian surface we can either construct a gaussian pill box or a gaussian cylinder here i am trying to construct a let us say a gaussian cylinder one end of the cylinder, let's say of area dA, lies within one of the plates, that is the positively charged plate, and the other end of the cylinder lies between the two plates. The areas, the cross sectional area of the cylinder, let, let us call this dA and dA prime. Now, the radius of this Gaussian cylinder is, let's call this small r, and let us assume a length of L for this Gaussian cylinder. So, the length or the distance at which we draw this is L. Now, using this approach, we can write using the Gauss law, the electric field multiplied by this area dA is equal to the charge enclosed. For this, the charge enclosed is sigma is the surface charge density multiplied by the area dA. epsilon naught. Now on the left side, if this is dA prime, then dA is equal to dA prime. So I am writing dA prime directly here so that these two will cancel and you will get the electric field between the two plates as sigma by epsilon naught directly. This is the result for electric field which we are going to use. Of course, where sigma is nothing but Q over A. Next, we will proceed to calculate the potential which is our second step. Then from there we can go to calculate the capacitance. Next step is potential between the two plates. The potential difference between the two plates is given by V is equal to negative of integral E dot dr. We know the electric field and Therefore, we can let us call this plate as let us say plate A and the other plate as B, then this integral will be from A to B. So, we are going to integrate the potential difference over this gap between the plates small d. That's what we are going to do. So, what we can directly do also is therefore, we can directly write as V is equal to E into D. That is a gap. We know that E is sigma over epsilon naught. Now that is multiplied by D. Therefore, I can write V as sigma over epsilon naught. Our sigma is actually Q over A. So Q D A divided over A epsilon naught. This is the expression for the potential difference between the two plates. So this is V is equal to Q D over a epsilon naught. Now, therefore, finally, we can calculate the capacitance C as Q over V, which is equal to Q over Q D over A epsilon naught. Therefore, we can conclude that the capacitance C 
of a parallel plate capacitor is epsilon naught a over d. This is the very important result in parallel plate capacitor. Therefore, here we can clearly see that the capacitance does not depend on the potential or the charge on the capacitor. Rather, the capacitance depends on the area of the capacitor as well as the gap between the two plates in the capacitor. So, it is purely a geometrical factor on which the capacitance depends on. The second type of capacitor that we are going to study is a spherical capacitor. The simple construction of a spherical capacitor is it contains two concentric hollow spherical shells. The inner conductor can be actually even a solid sphere, but the outer shell should contain the inner sphere within that. Now, the inner conductor is charged to a potential P plus with a charge plus Q. Its radius is R1. The outer shell has a radius R2 charged to a charge minus Q and potential V minus. So, this is the simple construction. The inner shell or the sphere inside we call it A whereas the outer shell should be called as B. Now, we can proceed to calculate the capacitance of the spherical capacitor using the same procedure. First, we will calculate the electric field, then the electric potential in a region between the two spheres and next we will go to calculate the capacitance using the simple relation. This is the idea. Now, we want therefore to find the electric field in a region between the two spheres. So, let me take a point P somewhere in between the two shells and try to calculate the electric field at this point. We can again take the Gaussian approach to calculate the electric field by drawing a Gaussian surface which also as per the symmetry of the problem should be a spherical surface. So, we have taken a spherical Gaussian surface to calculate the electric field. Let the radius of this Gaussian sphere be small r. Okay, so it's a sphere by geometry. Let this radius be r. Now, using Gauss's law, we can calculate the electric field using the same expression that is integral e dot ds is equal to charge enclosed over epsilon naught. The electric field is what we want. It is constant over the entire surface of radius R. So, E into. If you integrate ds, then you would get the total surface area of this Gaussian sphere, which is 4 pi R squared is equal to. The charge enclosed within this Gaussian sphere is only plus Q. The minus Q is outside it. So, we write plus Q over epsilon naught. Therefore, the electric field is equal to 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught q over r squared. This is the expression for electric field at a point P. Now, from this, we can calculate the electric potential or potential difference between the two plates that is given by the expression V is equal to negative integral of E dot dr. Now, we have to integrate between the two spheres. So, from R1 to R2, that is the limits of our integral. The electric field we have calculated. So, we will substitute that here negative 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r squared dr that is our electric potential therefore v is equal to constants q over 4 pi epsilon naught are taken out and then you have 
integral dr over r squared between the limits r1 and r2. Integration, if you do, you will end up getting minus 1 over r limits r1 and r2. So, therefore, the potential is q over 4 pi epsilon naught 1 over r1 minus that is, I am substituting the upper limit and the lower limit. This is the expression for potential for such a structure. Now, we can calculate the capacitance using the formula C is equal to Q over V which is equal to Q over Q R2 minus R1. I am taking LCM here. So, I am ignoring that single step over 4 pi epsilon naught R1 R2. So, if you rearrange this, you would get the potential, you would get the capacitance C as C is equal to 4 pi epsilon naught R1 R2 over R2 minus R1. This is the final result, which is the capacitance for a spherical capacitor. So, therefore, we have arrived at the result for capacitance of a spherical capacitor. Now, we can do two approximations to this result and try to arrive at two more results. The first result is what would be the capacitance of for a, an isolated sphere. So, the first approximation that I am going to do is capacitance for an isolated sphere. What do we mean by an isolated sphere? An isolated sphere is one in which the inner conductor is very far away from the outer conductor. That is, R2 is very, very large compared to R1. So, this is the condition under which we can call this capacitor as an isolated sphere. That is, the only the inner conductor is present and the outer conductor expands so much that R2 becomes much greater than R1. Under that condition, here from this formula, we can write the capacitor C is equal to 4 pi epsilon naught R1 R2 over R2 because R2 is much greater in comparison with R1. Therefore, these two R2s cancel and effectively capacitance becomes 4 pi epsilon naught. Let me call now R1 as just R. This is the expression for capacitance of an isolated sphere. So, the capacitance of an isolated sphere depends only on the radius of the sphere. It does not depend on the charge or the potential to which it is charged. This is a very important result. Using this one can calculate even the capacitance of earth. I leave it to you students to calculate the capacitance of earth. The earth's radius is a very well known constant. Using that, I advise the students to calculate and find out what is the value of the capacitance for earth because earth is a very interesting capacitor in itself. It can take as much charge as you dump to it as well as it can it, it can give as much charge as it is required. So, earthing is a very common utility that we all are aware of. Then, the second case that I am going to do is, second approximation that I am going to do is what is called the parallel plate approximation. In this approximation, we are going to assume that the two spheres have roughly the same radii but not exactly the same and the gap between the two spheres is very small and let us call that gap as D. The gap between the two spheres as, let us call this as D and the radii R1 and R2 or roughly the same, but not exactly the same. Under this approximation, 
what is the capacitance value that we are going to get let's see suppose if i use the same result and try to apply that to the situation what i will get is 4 pi epsilon naught since r1 and r2 are roughly the same r1 let me assume is equal to r2 which is equal to r therefore i would write 4 pi epsilon naught r1 r2 is r over r multiplied by r so you will get 4 pi epsilon naught r squared divided by r2 minus r1 in my case is i assume that to be the difference in the radii which is equal to d so if i substitute here d i am arriving at a result where this can be rewritten as 4 pi r squared multiplied by epsilon naught over d 4 pi r squared for any spherical surface is the area so i am my result is epsilon naught a by d that is the capacitance for such a capacitor such a spherical capacitor now this is same as the result that we arrived at for the parallel plate capacitor so this that's why this approximation is called as the parallel plate approximation this is valid only when the two radii are very close to each other they are comparable and under such circumstance the spherical capacitor behaves much like a parallel plate capacitor of course here the area is the surface area of the sphere and d is the gap between the two spherical shells the third type of capacitor that we are going to discuss is the cylindrical capacitor the structure of the cylindrical capacitor is such that there is an inner cylinder having radius r1 which is charged to plus q the outer cylinder has a radius r2 and it is charged to minus q now the length of the two cylinders is l this is the length of the capacitor we are going to calculate the capacitor for such a cylindrical capacitor using the routine procedure that we have been adopting for each of these capacitors that is first calculate the electric field from electric field calculate the potential and from there calculate the capacitance using this relationship q over v first therefore let us calculate the electric field e electric field for this capacitor can be calculated using Gauss's law so we have constructed a gaussian cylinder of radius small r and length x so we can calculate using the expression integral e dot ds is equal to q enclosed over epsilon naught in this case ds is the surface area that is a curved surface area of the gaussian cylinder there is no flux going through the two cross sectional areas of the cylinder the flux is the direction of the electric field is radial direction therefore we have to consider only the curved surface area therefore e into the curved surface area of the gaussian cylinder under consideration is 2 pi r x is equal to charge enclosed the charge enclosed is if the cylinder has a linear charge density lambda that can be defined as the total charge over the total length of the cylinder now we want to consider only the charge enclosed by the gaussian cylinder alone okay so integral e dot ds is equal to lambda x over epsilon naught electric field is constant over the entire Gaussian surface and the curved surface area of the cylinder Gaussian cylinder is 2 pi r is the radius of the Gaussian cylinder and its height or length is x is equal to lambda x over epsilon naught x and x cancels so the electric field is given as lambda over 2 pi or epsilon naught which can be written as q over 2 pi l r epsilon naught so this is the electric field now we can proceed to calculate the potential potential is negative integral of e dot dr between the limits r1 to r2 because the inner cylinder radius is r1 and the outer cylinder radius is r2 is equal to negative integral 
q over 2 pi l r epsilon naught dr. If you take the constants out, you get negative q over 2 pi l epsilon naught outside and integral of dr over r between the limits r1 to r2. This integral gives you long r. So, natural logarithm of r. So, negative q over 2 pi l epsilon naught logarithm of r is the integra integ integration result. So, you get r1 to r2. This is the potential. Therefore, I can write the potential as applying the limits and uh, absorbing the negative sign inside. I will write q over 2 pi l epsilon naught logarithm of r2 over r1. This is the result for the potential for this cylindrical capacitor. Now, the capacitance C is given as q over v which is q over q logarithm of r2 over r1 divided by 2 pi l epsilon naught. Q and Q can be cancelled. So, the final result is capacitance is equal to 2 pi l epsilon naught over logarithm of r2 over r1. This is the result for the capacitance of the cylindrical capacitor. Here it is important to remember that the flux direction for this particular charged object is radially outward. Therefore, any electric field component is going to be parallel to the top and bottom surfaces and that is why we are considering only the curved surface area here and ignoring the cross sectional areas of the cylinder. Thus, we are able to calculate the expression for the capacitance of a cylindrical capacitor using this approach. Our next topic sir, force between the plates of a parallel plate capacitor and energy stored in a capacitor and then from there we can calculate the energy density of the parallel plate capacitor. First what do we mean by the force between the plates of a parallel plate capacitor? There are two plates in a parallel plate capacitor. One of the plates is charged with a charge of plus Q and the other one is charged with a charge of minus Q. Now the electric field E due to one of these plates, let's say positive plate E is equal to sigma over 2 epsilon naught. Now the other plate, negatively charged plate in this case, is in the electric field of the first plate. Therefore, the force on the second plate F is equal to minus Q multiplied by this electric field E, which is equal to minus Q sigma by 2 epsilon naught. We know that the sigma is nothing but the surface charge density in this place. So, it is charge over the area of the plate A. Therefore, the force is equal to negative Q square by 2 epsilon naught A. We can very well ignore the negative sign and take only the magnitude of the force F to be equal to Q square over 2 epsilon naught A. Now, therefore, the expression for the force between the parallel plates of uh, plates of a parallel plate capacitor is Q squared over 2 epsilon naught A. Now, using this expression, we can proceed to calculate the energy stored in a capacitor. How is this energy stored here? Suppose initially the two plates of the capacitor are very close to each other such that there is hardly any gap between the two plates. One of the plates is charged again plus Q, the other one is charged minus Q. Therefore, there is going to be a strong force of attraction between these two plates and that is going to be equal to this particular expression. Now, if you have to separate the plates and keep it at a distance D between the two plates, then one has to apply a force against this force of attraction by pulling one of the plates apart. Let us say we are setting the two plates now by applying some force that is equivalent to this value in the opposite direction so that these two plates are set at a distance d apart. Right? 
Therefore, some work has to be done to do the separation. That work done is going to be equal to force times the distance through which the plate is moved, that is D. Therefore, the work done is equal to, using this expression, we can write Q square times D over 2 epsilon naught A. Now, this work done is the same as the energy stored in the capacitor, which is electrostatic potential energy. This is the energy stored in the capacitor. Therefore, if I use the symbol E for the energy stored in the capacitor, then that E is equal to Q square and this term epsilon naught A D is nothing but capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor. Now here D by epsilon naught A. So we have C in the denominator and this 2 is retained. So this is nothing but half Q square over C. That is the energy of a parallel plate capacitor. Which can be also written as half Q times V. Because Q by C is again we know that it is equal to V. Which is also the same as half C times V square. So, these are the three expressions for the energy stored in a parallel plate capacitor. From here, we can proceed to calculate the energy density of the capacitor. So, that we can see actually where is this energy stored in the capacitor, which part of the capacitor is storing this energy. For that, we can say that the energy density U is equal to the energy stored in the capacitor over the volume. That is energy per unit volume. For that consideration, what we have to do is, first we can assume that there is a gap of D1 between the two plates initially. In order to increase this gap, some amount of work has to be again done. Let us say the new separation between the two plates after some work is done in pulling this plate is now taking it to a new gap d2 between the two plates. Remember the plates are oppositely charged in each case. Therefore, we can straight away write an expression for the energy for such a case. What is the difference in energy between these two? So, we, have, we can use this expression for that. So, I am going to write now the <coughs> energy E1 is equal to Q square d1 divided by 2 times epsilon naught a. This is the area of the plates. In the second case, I will write e2 as q square d2 to epsilon naught a. Now, the work done in going from this configuration to this configuration is the energy stored in this particular case that is going to be equal to E2 minus E1 which is equal to Q square multiplied by D2 minus D1 over 2 epsilon naught A. So, this work then is the same as the energy stored in this particular configuration E. Now, by expanding this gap between the two plates from D1 to D2, the change in volume between the plates is area times the change in this distance. So, the volume change, I write it here simply as volume is nothing but area of the plate A multiplied by the difference in the distance in along this direction. So, D2 minus D1. Now, to write finally an expression for the energy density U is therefore energy epsilon which is Q square multiplied by D2 minus D1 by 2 epsilon naught A 
divided by a into d2 minus d1 which is the volume. So, we have energy stored divided by volume to get energy density. Okay. Proceeding further, we can here see that this d2 minus d1 and d2 minus d1 will cancel and remaining expression will be q square over 2 epsilon naught a square. Now this we can write as half, if I multiply by an epsilon naught, I can very well divide by another epsilon naught here to get epsilon naught squared a squared. Now this particular thing is equal to the electric field of the parallel plate capacitor that is the field between the two plates of the capacitor. So this is electric field squared because Q over epsilon naught A is the electric field. So the final expression for the energy density is U is equal to half epsilon naught E squared that is electric field squared. This is the expression for energy density of a parallel plate capacitor. So, where is this energy stored therefore? Here we can see that in the energy density expression, energy density U is equal to half epsilon naught E squared, where capital E is nothing but the electric field of the parallel plate capacitor. That means the energy stored in a capacitor is stored not in the plates, it is stored in fact in the electric field corresponding to the capacitor. So, the energy is actually stored in the electric field. This completes the part 1 of our video on capacitors for IIT G and even for NEET exams. In the part 2 of this particular uh, series, you would find me doing some problems on capacitors and then we can proceed to study what happens if capacitors are connected in com some combination. Particularly, what happens for capacitors if they are connected in series and parallel combinations. Please do look out for subsequent videos on this topic. Thank you.